Hello, hello, hello. This is attorney Mike Gravelin coming to you from Chicago as usual. And we had a sentencing in the Illinois versus Yone case today. Uh, I'll, I'll just give fair warning to everybody. It's it's a sentencing. We have victim impact statements. It's not fun. But I did the rest of the case, so we're going to do it. I believe Natalie was there. I sent her an invite. She might show up. She might not. I don't know. I didn't give her any notification. I sent her an invite like five minutes ago. <laughs> so that's where we are. Prob- probably won't be a, a fun one, but, but it, it's interesting. So let's do it, shall we? We'll go on the record in People versus Bradley S. Yawn, Adams County, 2021, CF 715. Mr. Yon is appearing in person in with his counsel, Mr. Nelson. Mr. Jones and Ms. Keck are appearing for the people. The matter was scheduled today for a sentencing hearing, but there has been a motion for judgment notwithstanding jury verdict or in the alternative motion for new trial. Filed by Mr. Nelson on behalf of Mr. Yon. So would you probably take that up first? That's yes, Your Honor. Order. All right, Mr. Nelson, any evidence to present on that or simply arguments? Just just argument. <clears throat> Mr. Jones, have you received the motion and had time to review it? I have, Your Honor. Are you prepared to argue also? I am, Your Honor. All right, so Mr. Nelson, it's your motion. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, much of the motion is uh, just <clears throat> stated clearly, I think, and for a lot of this, we will probably uh, just rely on the uh, written motion, the first paragraph, uh, of or subparagraph of paragraph two um, is that the evidence that was presented at trial in this case uh, was insufficient as to each of the charges, um, insufficient as a matter of law for the jury to find Mr. Yon guilty. And uh, we would ask that the court make that finding um, and <clears throat> and then proceed from there. Your Honor, do you want me to argue the, the rest of the, the motion or just take these one at a time? I have read the motion, and so um, anything beyond what's contained in the motion you wish to argue, I would go ahead and make the argument. We'll let the state respond to each one, and then we'll make this. Okay, this is silly. Of course, there was tons of evidence. The record was more than sufficient, but the attorney's not doing his job if he doesn't bring this motion because you want to preserve this issue on appeal. Decision. Thank you, uh, Your Honor. With respect to paragraph 2B, <clears throat> um, this paragraph pertains to uh, my function as standby counsel. Um, the, the jury was not uh, instructed as to uh, the role of standby counsel and uh, the role that I would be fulfilling. Um, the court did indicate in an order of October 12th. Uh, that the jury would be so informed. Um, as the court is aware, there were <clears throat> numerous times during the trial uh, that Mr. Yon and I spoke in front of the jury, um, and we don't really know what the jury was thinking without that particular instruction. Um, and as the law is that I have cited, um, Mr. Yon was entitled to, uh, to the perception that he alone was representing himself in this case. With respect to paragraph C, um, that paragraph pertains to the court uh, denying Mr. Yan's motion for funds for a polling service to investigate um, whether 
a motion for change of venue would lie, he did include uh, numerous attachments in that motion. And I think that the attachments that he did include um, at least substantially show that uh, he was entitled to investigate that issue uh, to see whether the veneer um, was prejudiced in this case. Paragraph D is um, pertains to Mr. Yon's uh, request for counsel on several different occasions, June 16th, June 30th, July 7th. Um, and of course that right to counsel is guaranteed by the constitution. Paragraph E, your honor, I will withdraw that. That, that is more of a uh, post-sentencing issue rather than a post-trial issue. And then paragraph F um, alleges that even if none of the, the previous errors standing alone is enough to warrant a new trial, uh, that in the aggregate, um, they would be. Thank you. Mr. Nelson, Ms. Kick, who's arguing? Thank you, Sorry, Mr. Jones. Um, Judge, I'll, I'll take the paragraphs in turn. With regard to paragraph A, I think the evidence here uh, was it's clear that there was sufficient evidence to support a finding of guilt to each of the charges. The court heard uh, the evidence that was presented at trial, the testimony from the witnesses, the forensic evidence, the uh, testimony of, about the items that were found on the defendant, the videos that were uh, shown showing the defendant driving the victim's car shortly after the incident occurred, all those things, uh, including uh, statements made to her, her doctor, uh, as well as the same. It was just pro se. I, I think based on the cumulative nature of the evidence and all the evidence taken together, there's clearly enough evidence for the jury to find those convictions. It's not even including the fact that the defendant's fingerprint was found on the spray can. He did a great job. DNA was found on that same spray can, um, including the footprint evidence, um, all that other evidence. I, I think there was more than enough evidence for the jury to find him guilty. And in fact, the jury did find him guilty. With regard to paragraph B, uh, I would have two points. One, uh, the, defend the defendant had every opportunity to offer any jury instructions that he wanted to offer, and he chose not to offer such an instruction. So that was his choice. Uh, he was representing himself. He cannot later complain that he failed to offer the instruction that was, was, uh, that was somehow insufficient when he had that opportunity and, and chose not to do that. But also point out that at no point in the trial did the people mention the role of standby counsel. It was never uh, brought to the jury's attention. We didn't say a word about it. The court never said a, a word about it. If that had been an issue, um, perhaps it should have been addressed, but it was never an issue at trial. Uh, so the question about what the jury was thinking, I guess what we can never know, but it was certainly never brought to the jury's attention. It was certainly never raised at trial that this was something that we should be concerned about. With regard to paragraph C, uh, the court did hear the defendant's motion for funds for a polling service. It was denied based on the evidence that was presented. In fact, uh, at voir dire, the court conducted extensive voir dire with members of the, uh, the jury panel and any individuals who had heard about the case and were not able to set that aside uh, were dismissed. Uh, we were able to get a jury frankly, relatively easily based on the nature of the, the case. It did not take as long as uh, a trial that Ms. Keck and I had done maybe perhaps a month before that. So again, I think that can be denied or should be denied as well. And it was not air for the court to deny that motion. Uh, with regard to paragraph D, again, I think the court made sufficient record of the denial for his request for counsel that it was done to delay the trial, much like if, when he asked for counsel in was it April? I believe in April. I sent Natalie a link. Here or March when we were here ready for trial. And right before the jury came in, he requested counsel to be appointed only to fire Mr. Nelson um, a few days or weeks later. Again, I think the court made a sufficient record at the time that he made those requests in June and July that he was doing it for delay. And frankly, Your Honor, if the court had granted it, he was just going to fire him again because that's Object, what it is. Your Honor. Mr. Yeah. Young, you have counsel, so you will not be objecting during this hearing. It'll be up to your attorney to decide if an objection will be made, and if so, 
what the grounds of that would be for work. So shut your hole. With regard to paragraph E, I know that Mr. Nelson has withdrawn that, but I would tell the court that today we'll be moving to dismiss uh, count two. Uh, we'll be doing that because the, uh, the count two is based on a criminal, I'm sorry, I apologize. Count two was based on count five, the aggravated criminal sexual assault, and uh, out of abundance of caution to make sure that any sentence imposed by the court is appropriate, we're going to move to dismiss count two so that there won't be issues with one act on crime or with count two and count five somehow merging. Um, so we'll be moving to do that today. As far as paragraph F, again, there are no, I don't think there have been any errors in this trial, and certainly any cumulative value of those errors is not enough to rise to the uh, standard that requires a new uh, trial or a judgment notwithstanding the jury's verdict. We'd ask that the motion in its entirety be denied. Mr. Nelson, last word? <clears throat> Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. The court has considered the arguments made. I've also had time to research the motion as it was timely filed back on September 1st. And as to the allegations in paragraph 2A, the court is in disagreement. I specifically went through each of the six counts, each element of each crime that the jury returned its guilty, guilty verdicts on and believe there was sufficient evidence of proof beyond a reasonable doubt for the jury to reach a conviction of Mr. Yon in each of those six counts. As to paragraph 2B, not instructing Hello, Natalie D. How are you doing? Hey, good. How are you? Sorry, I didn't know. I, I, I was sending you a link to come on my stream. Apparently, you were streaming. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's did totally I step on your fun. stream? I'm sorry? Did I step on your stream? I didn't mean no, to. No, no, no. It's totally fine. Uh, I didn't realize, though, that you had sent me your message, and I watched your um, your stream from the beginning, and you had mentioned it. And I was like, oh, I'll go check. Ah. <laughs> so here I am. So you were you were actually in Adams County today? Yes. Yep. Look at you. I was. Yeah. Look at yeah. you looking all scholarly with your glasses. I can got, see now, y'all. I've got my chest covered. <laughs> this is a solemn occasion. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It is. It was rough. It was. Well, rough. I, I would see. imagine the the vibe in the courtroom had to be bad. It was solemn. That's how I would explain it. It was it was very quiet. It was very respectful for the most part, minus um, the criminal there. He was not. But uh, yeah, it was it was tough. To, it was tough to hear. But, you know, it's important to hear those things, to, to know the victim, to understand where the yeah. family's coming from and take the spotlight off the I, I I dread this. this is one of the reasons I don't like doing trials because a lot of it's interesting. They're all serious cases, especially if they're criminal cases. There are serious cases that there's bad things happen. I, I, can, I can get past that. But when you get to victim impact statements at sentencing, yeah, I feel like I feel like I should do it because I did the whole trial. Yeah. But it's really it's really not in law talk with Mike material, you know? <laughs> It's not, I understand it's not funny, all that type of thing. But again, the family had to go through a lot and this is all over the media and being, you know, covered by ran different people. And so for the family to have their time, I think is really important, yeah. especially yeah. when they were being questioned by the person who did this to their family member yeah. on the stand. What, what was that? Who's that guy? The, the Waukesha, I can't, I can't, Daryl Brooks. I had to do yeah. it for, for, for some of this for Daryl Brooks. It was just brutal. Yeah. Just yeah. brutal. Yeah. I was watched was that. the port, was the courtroom packed or were, were you able to get in there? No, I was able to get in. I was surprised that it wasn't packed. Um, most of the courtroom were, were the family. Just said, they, hey, it's Natalie D clear the way. Yeah, exactly. I was like, make room you, for me. You, know, you didn't have to drop a lot of talk with Mike's name or anything. No, no, I, they, they let is me it, in is somehow. that would have done you zero good. I mean, zero good. <laughs> they would have been who? <laughs> no, all right. they all knew you. <laughs> all right, let's get back to this depression fest. I just want to say hi. I think that's really cool you were there. All right. Yeah, we're, we're, it was great to be there, actually. All right, let's do this. Here. 
the jury as to the role of standby counsel, Mr. Yan, in representing himself, had the obligation to raise the objection at the time or also to provide a instruction proposed for uh, the jury to be instructed on such. As he had not done so, he has not raised the issue in a timely fashion. And so the court finds that that argument is waived by Mr. Yan's inactivity and in bringing that to court's attention at the appropriate time. Nor did I have any indication from the jury that they had any question as to Mr. Nelson's role as standby counsel. As to paragraph 2C, the improperly denying funds to hire a polling service, again, at the appropriate time, no objection was made by Mr. Yon when he was representing himself. And as Mr. Jones has argued, there was no difficulty in finding 12 jurors to hear this case during jury selection and voir dire. Each was asked individually as to their knowledge and being exposed to any pretrial publicity and each of the jurors who were chosen agreed that they could set aside anything they had heard or read about this case and reach their verdict solely upon the evidence that was brought forth during the trial. As to paragraph 2D, that the court improperly denied the appointment of counsel. And as argued by Mr. Jones, and as the record will clearly show, Mr. Yon had played the game of coming up to trial, pro se, getting a continuance for counsel to be appointed. He was admonished prior to going pro se that he would not be allowed to change his mind. Counsel was reappointed. A delay of the jury trial occurred last year. He then discharged counsel that was appointed for him and wanted to go pro se. He was again admonished that he would not have the opportunity to change his mind. <coughs> and so it was only within weeks of the trial that he thereafter decided he wanted an attorney appointed. So Mr. Yon wants to fall upon the sword of I have a right to counsel in this argument, but Mr. Yon also had the right to represent himself pro se. That is the choice he knowingly and voluntarily made. And so we weren't going to repeat the cycle a third time as the court previously found the motions for appointment of counsel were for the sole purpose of delay. And so that motion is denied as to the request in 2D with the state's dismissal of count two and the withdrawal of 2E, we won't need to address that. And as to any cumulative effect of such errors, I did not find any cumulative errors. And so the motion is denied in whole for those reasons. Now, we'll proceed with a sentencing hearing in Ooh. this matter. Hi, JR. And is the state prepared for sentencing hearing? We are, Your Honor. And Mr. Nelson, are you prepared for the defense? Yes. The court has received a pre-sentence investigation report. And the original report is in 22 CF 671, filed on June 1st of 2023. It is referenced in the pre-sentence investigation report filed in this matter. 21 CF 715, and that was filed also June 1st of 2023. Then there's been a first supplement to the precinct's investigation report that was recently filed. So Mr. Jones, have you received a copy of each of those pre-sentence investigation reports? I have, Your Honor. And to your knowledge, are there any additions or corrections for the state? Yes, Your Honor, we have one uh, correction to note on the front page of the first supplement um, to the pre-sentence investigation report indicates the day served was 611. That is correct in the sense that it, it when it stopped, uh, but it stopped when he was taken to the Department of Corrections. So he's actually entitled to 680 days. Uh, and we would ask the record to reflect that. So with that correction being made, Mr. Nelson, have you received those pre-sentence investigation reports and supplements? I did, Your Honor. And are there any corrections or additions? Your Honor, we had the same uh, correction with respect to uh, credit for days served. We have no other 
corrections and uh, no additions. Judge, I apologize. We have one other uh, correction to note. The court had received in the pre-sentence investigation a victim impact statement from Ilsa Terrell, uh, the daughter of the victim, um, that had been updated or corrected and we provided the court, Mr. Nelson, with a new copy of that today. That would, that's what I need to make a record of that as well. All right, and the court did receive that. Uh, Mr. Nelson, did you receive the Ilsa Terrell victim impact statement? It would be a more recent one than one attached. I did. All right. Does the state have any evidence it wishes to present for sentencing hearing? We have one witness that we would call, Your Honor, and then there are multiple victim impact statements that have been asked to be read to the court. All right. If you're prepared to do so. People would call John Shoney to the stand. If you'd come forward, sir, to the clerk. And we'll have you raise your right hand. She'll swear you in. This is just bizarre. With the stands. <clears throat> Mr. Jones, when you're ready with your questions. Thank you. Uh, can you tell me your name, please? Uh, John Shoney. What do you do for a living? I'm an investigator with the Adams County Sheriff's Office. Um, a few weeks ago, did you uh, receive a uh, or have a meeting with an individual you know by the name of Tim Schmidt? Yes. Can you tell me why Mr. Schmidt uh, approached you? Uh, he had received a letter in the mail from the defendant. Did you get a chance to review that letter? Yes. In the course of this trial, have you had the opportunity to review numerous filings made by the defendant in his handwriting? Yes. Hundreds? Yes. Did you review the letter that Mr. Schmidt provided you? I did. And in your uh, opinion, did it appear to be the same handwriting? Yes. Did the letter also include information that would be uh, consistent with an individual who had knowledge of the case? Yes. And was in fact signed Mr. Bradley Yawn at the bottom of that letter? Yes. And it was dated August 10th, 2023. Is that correct? Correct. I just want to talk about parts of that letter. Do you have a copy of that letter with you? I, I do. I left it at my seat, but yes. Your Honor, I'd ask the witness to be allowed to, to go get that copy of the letter and bring it back to the witness. <clears throat> Be fine. Let me speed things up. Fair to say, it appears to be, I think, an eight page letter. Correct. I'm not going to read all eight pages. I just want to talk about a, a few paragraphs in the letter. Um, the letter starts with the word Tim, and then it goes on to say in the defendant's handwriting, I often ask myself, how unhonest can a person truly be? How does a man with whom is with a woman 36 years not know that woman as he truly should? Did I read that correctly? Correct. Did he then continue to say, one thing I ask that I cannot ask myself, did you get your money's worth? Did I read that correctly? That's correct. The letter goes on to say, did Tim Schmidt and family get what they paid for with their money, power, and influence? You have my life now, Tim, and guess what? I was no part of the idiocy that occurred on November 9th or whenever. Did I read that correct? Correct. On the second page of that letter, did he write approximately six lines down? Lies, deceit, fabrication, manipulations, power, wealth, influence, and friends in high places just took that from me, all put forth by your family and you. That's correct. On the third page of that letter, did he write, 
A lot of people lied in this matter. They went off what they were led to believe, and then some even added things. Do you like liars, Tim? That's correct. On the next page of that letter, the first full paragraph, once again, if I were included, nothing like that would have been left. You people made the perfect crime scene, Tim. Did I read that correctly? Correct. The two key objects just left right there. How convenient, exclamation point. You could have at least made it look good by throwing it out in the driveway or bushes, but no. Aerosol can and knife just left right there in the middle of the floor. Yeah, okay, not likely. Did I read that correctly? That's correct. The next page of the letter, did he write this? Don't I'll make tell me you in this, Jenny. How? How your influence is going to get a lot of people into some trouble. Some just were not slick enough, Tim. For example, Kelsey Miller or Josh Jones, whoever it was that tampered with your wife's statement. That's not over. We have higher courts than Athens. Did I write that correctly? Correct. Or read that correctly? Correct. Thank you. That's all the questions I have. Mr. Nelson, any cross? No, thank you. No, thank you. Any further evidence for the state other than the victim impact statements? No, Your Honor. Yeah, you wish to do those now? Uh, whatever the court wants to do that now is fine. All right. Let's go ahead and do the victim impact statements at this point. Your Honor, we'll have them uh, read from the, uh, the uh, witness stand so that uh, it can be heard if that's okay. First, we have uh, Tim Schmidt. Good afternoon, if you'd come forward and have a seat in the witness stand. <coughs> Victim impact statements are not under oath and are not subject to cross-examination. We're simply having you give your statement from the stand so you're close to a microphone and we have a clear record. Your Honor, just so I can help, if you could state your name and spell your last name for the court reporter first. Okay, it's it's Tim or Timothy Schmidt, S C H M I T T. Um, Mr. Yawn, you've heard a lot of people, including my wife and me and her family, uh, and, and including yourself. How would you like this to have happened to your mother or your sister or any of other of your family? You're a menace to society. And they're going to send you to prison and they're not going to let you out. I hope you repent and ask God for his forgiveness because you're going to have plenty of time in there to think about it. Heidi Young, Your Honor. I actually spoke with him unknowingly that it was him while I did it. And he's so sweet. So sweet. Did you actually talk to him? 
Yeah, I did. Um, because I sat right behind him. They were, we were told to sit, um, on one side of the courtroom so the family could sit on the other side. And I sat right. where I was supposed to, and he was directly in front of me. So I didn't realize it was him. And I went to move closer, um, and sat right next to him and, and just, you know, said that I'm coming to sit closer without looking at him. And then I looked at him, um, and then realized that it was him. And uh, a, I felt terrible that I had just said that and not, you know, realized that it was him. Um, but he was super, super sweet. He was like, yeah, I understand. Like, oh, just so sweet. Just so sweet. Yeah. And he did, he did, he did a really nice job right there. I mean, what, what else can you say? You just, yeah. Drop yeah. the truth and left. I, yep. you know. Yeah, he did. He did. My name is Heidi Young. It's Y-O-U-N-G. My mom was a wonderful mother, grandmother, great grandmother. She adored her family, would do anything for us. You could call her with a problem and she would figure it out. If you were facing an important decision, she would listen to you, but ultimately she would always tell you to do the right thing. Many times the right thing was not the thing you wanted to do. On November 9th, 2021, my mom had put in a hard day at work and was exhausted. She was heading home to take a nap and freshen up before she went out to eat dinner with her husband. However, on her way home, she had the misfortune of running into you and Karen Blackledge Henderson. Um, we all know what happened after that. I'm not going to go into that. We've all been through that. Um, my husband and I drove her to Boston ER to have the sexual assault kit done. She was exhausted, hurting, scared, hungry, thirsty. She was bleeding and still in shock. The sexual assault kit was an invasive and embarrassing procedure. I wanted to protect her and make it stop. I sat there wondering why she was putting herself through more pain and humiliation. The next day, she told me why. It wasn't for her, it wasn't for the police, or even to get justice. Her main concern was that you could not hurt anybody else the way you had hurt her. You see, she did the right thing. Had you done the right thing that night with and just held my mom with her headlights and went on about your merry way, we wouldn't be here today. And my mom would be here today. Now, I know we cannot hold you accountable for her death in this court, but we all know that you're responsible for her death. Um, she had, she had she'd not been brutally assaulted by you. I have no doubt she would be here today. Mr. Yon, have you ever thought about how different your life would be if you ever did the right thing? I mean, you have, you have said that you had various construction jobs. Could you imagine what your life would look like today if you'd kept working hard and doing the right thing? Probably own your own construction company, probably have a nice house, fancy car, beautiful family, maybe even a dog in the yard. However, here we are. You keep choosing the wrong thing and leaving a path of destruction. You've hurt innocent people and have taken what isn't yours. Now you're facing a lot of time in prison. People say to me, aren't you glad justice is being served and now maybe you can move on? Well, no amount of time can bring my mom back and I'm not sure I can ever move on. However, I agree with my mom. I don't want you to be able to hurt anyone else like you hurt her. I, and I want no other family to go through the devastating grief we've gone through. With your long criminal history, I feel the only way to keep everyone safe is for you to be away from the public for a very long time. What am I going to do now? I'm going to try to heal up from all this. I'm going to try not to harbor bitterness in my heart. I'm going to love my family with everything I have in me. And you know what else I'm going to do? I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray that that while in prison, you start doing the right thing. That when you're faced with a decision, you start doing the right thing. Um, and I'm also going to pray that you find a close personal relationship with God and that you turn your life around. Why in the world would I do that after everything you did to my mom and my family? Why? Well, because it's what my mom would have wanted me to do, and it's the right thing. Michael Loman, Your Honor. I apologize, Your Honor. Uh, Michael Loma is not here. It has been provided to the court. He's asked that we read that into the record today, Your Honor, so it's court's permission. Sure. 
As a son, I was both surprised and shocked by what I learned in the courtroom. I was not told a lot of the details of the attack on my mother, Tina Lohman Schmidt. This was probably to shield us from knowing the severity of what happened. My mother was mentally strong, able to block out what happened to her while never forgetting it. Since the attack, my family has had to change our lifestyle. I no longer go uh, to bed without making sure all the doors are locked and security system is on. We now find ourselves less likely to help others, nor do we allow others to help us. As a father of daughters, I continue to express the strengths of my mother and how she was not afraid to stand up to those who attacked her and robbed her at knife point. We will never understand what was going on in your mind when you attacked my mother. While our lives go on, we continue to remember and pass on the grace and kindness my mother showed to people. We also look at the fact that because of your actions, my daughter won't have her grandmother at her wedding and my grandchild will not get to play and know their great grandmother. Money, cars and jewelry, even rosaries can be replaced. My mother cannot. I hope that you think about what you did and know that your actions have put you in the position you are in today. Derek Lohman, Your Honor. Derek Lohman, hello, HMN. Uh, during the trial, one person in the media asked what I would say to Bradley on if he was sitting across the table uh, from me. My answer was nothing. I don't know this man. He's just some violent person who unfortunately encountered my mother on a dark road when she was born. He has no bearing on our lives. And after he's hopefully sentenced to spend the rest of his life in prison, I won't give him a second thought. The real tragedy is the legal system that failed Tina Loman in the first place. In St. Charles County, Missouri, Jan was released accidentally due to the failure of Sergeant Kara Campworth to enter a warrant for his arrest properly, and he was allowed to leave the jail without being held fully accountable. Most people would have used this accident as a second chance to stay out of trouble. <clears throat> Several days after being accidentally released, Bradley Young stole vehicles and then continued to rob, rape, and instill fear into my mother. He had several chances to take the money and jewelry and just leave her alone. That's all he had to do. He chose to brutalize her and commit an assault on her body, escalating the scenario for his sick pleasure. Bradley Yon has proven that he cannot live in a normal society without assaulting others and needs to be removed from society permanently for the safety of those who do the right things and don't take advantage of others. I would ask this court to sentence Bradley Yon to the maximum sentence allowable to make sure this waste of a human life can never terrorize another innocent person. Tina Lohman did not deserve this person to intrude into her life, a life filled with children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, which she loved and lived for. I was fortunate to spend the week with my mother after the attack, but unfortunately this time was filled with fear and dread at going back to her home where this awful crime occurred, a home where she had previously felt safe and celebrated the holidays with family. Not long after Tina Lohman passed away and left a gaping hole in our family, which will never be filled. Please make sure this doesn't happen to another family by sentencing Bradley on to the fullest extent of law. He has shown no more remorse for his actions. I think he needs to be held fully accountable. Thank you. Ilsa Terrell. I'm Ilsa Terrell, T-E-R-R-E-L-L. -L. Mr. Yan, Yon, Yon, whatever it is, here we are today. I ant anticipated this day like some miraculous thing would happen and my mother, Christine Loman, would come back. I wrote letter after letter thinking if I said the right words today, I would feel justice was served, that you would take responsibility for what you did to my mother, that you would somehow feel my pain. Nothing I wrote or anything I said changes anything. 685 days since I first heard your name and knew your face, a face my mother described as a leprechaun off a Lucky Charms box, but dirty. My mother survived your heinous attack and made sure you were finally off the streets after St. Charles County made a huge mistake by accidentally releasing you. 685 days, we have heard all about your injustices. 
like you are the victim of this crime. You had no, <clears throat> no idea of the layer upon layer of injustices our family has faced. Hell, my own mother's husband could not even honor her dying wishes. No one will take responsibility for their part in all the injustices that were handed to my mother and her family. You wrote a long Facebook post about your grandmother, recognizing her as the woman who raised your mother and taught her how to be a woman, a mother. Good job, Granny. Remember my mom saying to you, I'm old enough to be your grandmother. What would she think of you right now? Today means nothing. Nothing miraculous is going to happen and I will feel no peace leaving the courtroom today. It's just the chapter is done. I have heard over and over from friends, now you can start to heal. You don't heal for some, from something like this. The idea of it hap ever even happening haunts you deep in the night. My mother was robbed of her dignity from everyone and to live her out her golden years with that dig dignity. I don't get to heal because there will always be a piece of me missing for the rest of my life. I can try to fill it with people and things, but I know I will always feel that void of my mother. I will forever hold space for her though, and nothing can fill that space. She was the first heartbeat I felt and the first love I knew. Carly Highland. Okay, I, I you know, this isn't a funny thing, but uh, I do have to give her credit for, for dropping the term heinous and calling him a dirty leprechaun. Okay, so that comes up again, just wait. Um, but the leprechaun thing, people in the courtroom were laughing, especially the family. Um, they, I mean, they were so <laughs> no, no, I feel better because that's <laughs> it solemn and everything, but you like, it's just kind of dirty and petty and I, and I just enjoyed it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they've been through so much. I am glad yeah. that they got that. And there, there's a, there's another point that the family was laughing. You'll know what, when you hear it. All right. I had to get that off my chest. Now I feel better. Thank you, Natalie. By the way, Natalie D's channel, link in the description below. Go over there, like, subscribe. She was at the trial today. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I was sitting like I'm just out of camera shot. That's very cool. What was that? A couple hours over there? Yes. Yeah. I'm Carly Highland. H-I-L-A-N-D. I'm not trying to die. I've written and rewritten my state several times, and I've decided that nothing I say or do will bring my grandma, Tina Loman, back to us. And even if it did, it wouldn't erase what happened. She is who I care about today, not you. Not Bradley Yon, not what happens to him. He has proven over and over that he has no remorse for what he's done, and he has no mental capacity to do so. If the day ever comes where he does, maybe I would have more to say. But as of today, everything we say today will fall on deaf ears. I'm not going to give you the satisfaction of hearing the pain that you've caused my family and I. I've sat here for almost two years, anywhere from once a month to once a week in this courtroom, watching you clown this courtroom, watch you clown the state's attorneys, my family and my grandma spreading your lies and conspiracy theories and trying to get the rise out of anyone you can. You're nothing but a coward. You're a small, weak man. It's really laughable because you think you're the smartest man in the room. You've proven time and time again that you are quite the opposite. You're so weak and little that you had to attack a 77-year-old woman no, I wouldn't. to feel like you're something, and that's embarrassing for you. I'm embarrassed for you, your family, and anyone who's ever known you. And you're nothing. Here you are, the end of your game. No cards left to play, finally. I was with my grandma the night she passed. She was surrounded by us, her family, who she loved more than her own self. I promised her that we would all be okay, and that we would get through this together, and we will. As for her death and the circumstances surrounding it, we are also not done. We will find all the players involved in this sick game, and we will seek the truth, even if justice is unobtainable. But as for you, Bradley Yon, your part in this game has finally ended, and I wish you nothing but the worst. Dalton Highland. I like that. 
Yeah, she was really sweet. I talked to her too on the way out. Let's get that touch, touch better than it needs. Absolutely deserved. My name is Dalton Highland. Um, when I think about the impact your crime had on my grandma, I think it's pretty obvious. If you never would have crossed paths, I would still have her here. I would still be able to hear a contagious laugh, <clears throat> feel the way she would squeeze me so tightly, kiss me on the cheek, no matter how old I got. I'd be able to smell her perfume and see her huge smile and uh, see her huge smile that she'd have every time I got to see her. If I had her here with me, I'd be showered with gifts on every occasion. I'd meet her at her favorite restaurant to catch up. I'd pop in her office just to say hi. I'd call her on every holiday to tell her I love her. The fact is I don't have her anymore because of you. She'll never be able to see uh, my kids grow up, to hear the way they talk, or to give them any more gifts or sneak in one more, one last hug. The few years that they got to spend with her and the impact that she had on them will hold a special place in their hearts. My grandma was a woman that couldn't be forgotten. Her love, her style, her faith, and her demeanor made her unforgettable. Every one of my family members that got the privilege of growing up with her could tell you countless stories of how she impacted our lives. She will be remembered here on earth long past her death, and we will see, And when we see her again in heaven, we will all cry tears of joy instead of the tears that we've cried since she passed. The same cannot be said of you. There will be no one sharing pleasant memories of you or how you impact their lives. You might think this crime in this case is in some way going to cause your name to be remembered in the years to come. It won't. You'll be forgotten as soon as we close this chapter. Even though what you did to my grandma was unspeakable, I don't hold any unforgiveness in my heart toward you. In fact, I feel sorry for you that at the end of your road, whenever that may be, that you won't have the full and lasting impact that she had. Thank you. Joshua Loman. They really are a sweet group. My name is Joshua Loman, L-O-H-M-A-N. I'm Tina Loman's oldest grandchild. She helped me, raise me. She was like my second mom. We, we had a very close bond. She always told me how much she loved me. And it made me feel so special. She adored my four children. She made me made sure they were spoiled on every birthday and Christmas. She loved Christmas and she loved giving gifts. That was the time that our whole family came together. I could not be here for the hearings, nor the trial, but I kept in the media and watched the trial online. My grandma and I talked after your horrible attack that you did, but she had told me everything. I think she was trying to prevent me from being too upset. However, as I watched the trial and learned the gruesome details, I became physically sick. How could you have done that to my grandma? Kidnapping, carjacking, robbing? Was it enough for you? You had sexually assaulted her and hurt her like, like you did. I'm angry and I'm sad when I think about it. It scares me. Scared, scared she, she, what she had to go through. But yeah, no right to do that to my grandma, nor to anybody. It scares me what to think that uh, there are people like you in this world. You need to go to prison for a very long time, not just for the justice for my grandma, but so you can't hurt anybody else. I was the person that used to stop and help people. If they need help on the side of the road, now I'm just too scared. I don't know what's going to happen. I had to think twice. I'll believe the actions that you led to my grandma's death. I drove four hours the night she died, and I was, I was an hour late. I didn't get to see it die. I, was, I still showed up for my family that night. We went to the Tower Pizza. Um, my grandma meant the world to me and to my kids, and she, she was taken from us too soon. There's a huge hole in my heart, and it cannot be filled, not to mention. I hate seeing my mom, my aunt, my uncles, and my cousins struggling to carry on without her. My grandma was a beautiful, classy woman, 
You tried, but you failed to take away her pride and dignity. Nothing done here today could bring my grandma back, but I truly, I truly hope there will be justice for her. I'll be praying for you. There was not a dry oh, eye in the courtroom they, after they him. Mary Beth Loman, that they've asked to read and get a record. Mary Beth Loman, M A R I B E T H Loman, L O H M A N. My mother in law was a tough woman. She was responsible, smart, driven, vivacious, outgoing, and beautiful. She could make the best of any worst. Before the evening of November 9th, 2021, her worst meant beginning her family, struggling to make ends meet, being used, dismissed, lied to, cheated on, and taken for granted. The evening of November 9th, 2021, my mother-in-law made the smart and responsible decision to pull over and to figure out why her headlights weren't on. What kind of person takes a situation like that and spins it into the nightmare scenario detailed in this court. Bradley S. Yawn noticed, and in that moment, decided without hesitation how he was going to respond. He could have chosen to stay in the background that night, remembering that he had just been released, mistakenly, from jail in Missouri. He could have been trying to lay low, avoid trouble. It's terrifying to think that any one individual, let alone two, could be so cruel and high heinously, heinously sadistic. Seriously, that's not how it's pronounced. Look it up. Okay, he chose this. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> he terrorized, degraded, they thought it was funny too. And hurt a woman old enough to be his own grandmother. He chose to do this not just once that night, but repeatedly. He pursued her even when it meant he had to kick in a locked garage door to get her back under control despite the uncertainty of what or who could be waiting on the other side of that door. He enjoyed terrorizing, degrading, and hurting her with physical, emotional, and sexual assaults while taking anything he could from her, everything she had with her, on her, and everything she could think of to bargain with, all for a chance to survive the circumstance he put her in. I can't imagine what it took for mom to overcome the shock and horror of this assailant's intent, the depth of his depravity. I can't imagine what it took to focus and think, to strategize through the fear and pain of the ordeal he subjected her to. She knew she had nothing to lose by offering more than they had already taken from her. She hoped there would be another person at her house. She knew there was a gun and she knew where it was, was she thought she knew how to use it. She took a chance. She ran. She put a locked door between them and herself. They could have run, taken off in her car with her purse, phone, jewelry, but he decided he would not let this end with her escape. Any explanation for that pursuit paints a terrifying picture of his intent toward her. She stayed focused, assessed her assailant's nature, objectives and intelligence, reassessed her options, knowing husband and gun were not there. That doesn't leave room for much in the way of hope. Instead, she found opportunity by playing on Jan's apparent frustration, anger, urgency, fear of arrest, and his general lack of knowledge. She tricked him, told Jan their basement safe hidden behind a discarded door in a house on a river bottom road was connected to the QPD and that by spinning the dial, he surely triggered an alarm and the police would be on their way. Really? It's just not logical. In short, mama told a tall tale and it paid off. She outsmarted him and his accomplice again. Mom paid a heavy price that night, but it wasn't with her life. No doubt mom saved other potential victims people who could have crossed paths and been subject to the same kind of heinous, incomprehensible experience. It just can't be comprehended. She stayed with the police to provide information they would need to identify, track, and capture her attackers. She stayed to tell investigators where they could potentially find evidence they would need to detain those attackers once captured. 
She allowed a physical examination to collect any evidence remaining with her to corroborate her account, documenting the marks Bradley had left on her body. All that information and evidence screamed just how urgent it was to capture, and this time to keep Bradley S. Yawn, the one who attacked her in jail. She survived long enough to know the people responsible for hurting her were caught, to see their mugshots, and know that they would never again draw a truly free breath. Mom became fr frantically occupied with anything that anchored her in the comfort, familiarity, and safety of her family and life before the 9th of November, 2021. Those efforts could only sustain her until the middle of December that same year. It's one thing to survive such a nightmare, but quite another to process the trauma that follows. We wish she were still with us, but there's some comfort in knowing that she doesn't have to live in fear of quiet times when this trauma of this experience could creep in and haunt her memory. She doesn't have to walk into a house infused with the trauma of a man who would abuse, use, humiliate, callously objectify her, take anything she had to offer, all for his own deviant gratification while entertaining a girlfriend, accomplice, with the humiliations and pain they were jointly inflicting. We miss mom. Life without her is so much less. It's less colorful, bright, full, warm, forgiving, supportive, and hopeful. It's definitely less stylish, less put together, and silence fills the room she brought to life. She was the embodiment of holiday. She was live out loud, created excitement and anticipation. She created opportunity through ing ingenuity and sheer will. She was a force of life, wicked smart, sometimes, lots of times, smart assed and funny, a little green eyed, beautiful blonde, fashionably wrapped and seemingly unstoppable. Mom was all about family. She was an active figure in our lives and she was determined to continue on that track. She would make provisions for us even as she got older and experienced health issues herself. She would do everything possible to provide for us or offer guidance, like it or not. She couldn't fathom the notion of tough love and she wouldn't tolerate anyone taking advantage of her family. Mom was our family's structure and support. She could carry whatever burden circumstance placed on her and then she'd carry ours too. Even before her attack, she inspired a legacy of commitment to family, bravery, focus, intelligence, perseverance, and resilience. We hope to carry on with that inspiration as we preserve her memory for the generations. As for mom's attacker, Bradley S. Yawn, I hope this court sees fit to afford him sentences that reflect every intentional offense, hurt, and humiliation he enjoyed at mom's expense. She unquestionably lived that night and every day of the rest of her life, trying to avoid the fear, disgust, and pain he caused in her. In recognition of that, I hope the court and the prison he is housed in will keep him where he can't hurt anyone else. And I hope he stays there every day without question for the rest of his life. Thank you. That would conclude the victim impact statement, Your Honor. <coughs> Any further evidence for the people? No, Your Honor. Right, Mr. Nelson, does the defense have any evidence they wish to present? No evidence, thank you. You have the right to make a statement directly to the court telling me anything that you think oh, yeah, I should yeah. know before I sentence you. Your statement in allocution is voluntary. You do not have to make a statement, but if you would like to make a statement, now would be the time to do so. Your Honor, uh, people in the stands, I did not hurt your mother, your grandmother. I did not do any of that. I wasn't part of that this night. I was not there. There's a lot more to this than y'all know. Your Honor, I'm not guilty for this at all. All right. All right. Thank you for your statement, Mr. Young. Yeah, 
has two arguments and recommendations for sentence. Mr. Jones. Thank you, Your Honor. May police court counsel. Judge, I will I will start with um, this before we get into the actual arguments. I think it would be helpful to go over what the defendant could be could be facing. With regard to count one, the charge of home invasion, he is looking at six to 30 years. With regard to count three, aggravated kidnapping, he is looking at six to 30 years in Department of Corrections. Uh, and again, that is discretionary consecutive with count one. Count four, aggravated vehicular hijacking, he is looking at six to 30 years. And again, that is discretionary consecutive with counts one and three. Count five is aggravated criminal sexual assault. He's looking at a minimum of 16 and a maximum of 40 years with that. That is mandatory consecutive with the other counts. Count six, the residential burglary, that would merge into count one. So we will not be asking for the court to impose a sentence on count six. So by my math, Your Honor, he is looking at a maximum of 130 years. If the court were to choose, choose to impose the maximum sentence on every case and to have them run consecutive with each other. So what court, what should the court impose? Your Honor, when um, this case started on November 9th, 2021, nearly two years ago, I wasn't sure what I would ask for in a case like this. When I was discussing the case with Ms. Keck, we had lots of different ideas how we would approach the sentencing hearing today. I thought about just going through the factors in aggravation and mitigation and, and listing them, and I know the court will do that. The court looks at the factors in aggravation. Several of them apply. The defendant's conduct caused and threatened serious harm. It absolutely did. The defendant received compensation for committing the crime. He absolutely did. He has a prior history of delinquency and criminal activity. It's listed in the PSI, Your Honor. The, uh, the defendant uh, assaulted an elderly person. That's a factor in aggravation. The court should consider that she was over 60 years of age. All those are factors in aggravation. And looking at the factors in mitigation, frankly, none of those apply. So I thought about just making that argument, but Your Honor, that argument seems more like a math problem. And this case is not just a consideration of the statutory factors that the court requires us to consider. Thought about talking about the frustration of the family because they have been incredibly frustrated for the last two years. And, and I recognize that frustration. Um, there were so many meetings where they wanted to know more and we couldn't tell them. And there was a reason why, but that reason isn't easily understood by a person who's going through trauma and loss. They were faced with delays and motions and delays and motions and delays and motions again and again and again. And every time we would have a meeting with them, they would tell us how frustrated they were. And every time we would say, there will be a day when you get your chance to talk to the defendant, but it's not today. And it took two years, but we got to that point. And I do apologize for the frustrations that you guys have had to deal with over and over again. It's not fair. But ultimately, the system of justice should be concerned with the victim's rights, but it's not. It's concerned with the rights of the defendant until we get to the point of sentencing. And that's where we are now. And I can't imagine what Tina's family had to go through, not just the delays and the motions and the delays and the motions, but then having to take the witness stand and answer questions from the person who violently sexually assaulted their mother. The bravery that they showed in taking the witness stand and answering his questions, despite the manner in which he did it, cannot be understated. I thought about just talking about that, but Your Honor, that's not about this case either. Really what this case is about and what this sentencing should be about is a 76-year-old grandmother who endured a nightmare that none of us should have to experience. What happened to her that night was something that doesn't happen in Adams County. It doesn't happen in the H judicial circuit. That's not who we are. That's not what Quincy is. That's not what Adams County is. We are a community where if you get stuck on the side of the road and you need help, somebody's going to show up to help. Chair. 
That's what we Great all expect. Team. We don't expect to be carjacked, to be sexually assaulted, to have our house door kicked in, to be followed into the house, sprayed with carpet cleaner. That's a movie, Your Honor. That's something you watch on Halloween to scare you. That's not real life, but it was real life for Tina Loma on November 9, 2021. The court saw the pictures of her injuries. The court saw the chemical burns to the inside of her mouth where that man sprayed her with carpet cleaner. The court saw the bruises on her knees, the bruises on her hands, the tears on her vagina. Calling it a nightmare isn't really enough. But that's what Tina Lohman lives with, and that's what she lives with every day for the rest of her life until she dies. That memory. Ms. Keck and I prosecute some of the worst individuals in Adams County. The crimes we see are frightening. But every time we prosecute a case, it's remarkable to me that Ms. Keck tells me things like, look for the humanity of the defendants. And we try to recognize that everybody is a human being and has a certain amount of respect and dignity due to them. I will be honest, Your Honor, this is the one case that I cannot say that. I cannot find the humanity in this defendant and what he did to Tina Lohman on November 9th. I have never asked for a sentence of 130 years before. In 22 years of doing this, in the 12, 12 years that Ms. Keck has done this, we have never asked for a sentence of 130 years before. But Your Honor, I would ask the court this. If any crime deserves 130 years, what crime could it be? And if any defendant deserves the maximum penalty that this court can impose, what defendant should it be? This is the crime that calls out for that penalty, and this is the defendant that calls out for that punishment. Your Honor, I'm asking the court to impose a 30-year sentence on each of the Class X felony offenses. I'm asking the court to find in its discretion that each of those sentences be consecutive to each other. I'm asking the court to impose a 40-year sentence on the aggravated criminal sexual assault. That sentence is mandatory to be consecutive with those other sentences. Nothing we do here today can bring back Tina Loma. Nothing we do here today can really even bring a sense of peace or justice to her family. But what we can do here today, Your Honor, is ensure that this defendant will spend the rest of his life in prison for every second of every day. 130 years is the most appropriate, most fair, and the most justice sentence that this court can impose. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Mr. Nelson, here to argue your recommendations as to sentence. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Your Honor, one <clears throat> thing that I often do um, particularly in, in cases like this, is I try to imagine my client's baby photo or a preschool photo or some sort of a photo from my client's early years. Because certainly the life that my client has now is not the life that my client has always had. And <clears throat> when I imagine or try to imagine that photo, it's often unavailable. When I imagine that photo, <clears throat> I wonder what was life like for my client? Did my client in those tender years feel safe? Was there trauma in my client's life? What circumstances in my client's young years came to influence my client today. 
And the truth is that we actually have almost no information about Bradley's early years. The photos that so many of us have on Facebook that we've posted of our early years or that uh, family members have posted of us, they just don't exist for Bradley. And <clears throat> I know there's information in the PSI about the, the siblings that Mr. Yon has. He has eight biological siblings. He has five step siblings. None of those siblings sent in a letter describing anything about Mr. Yon's early life or anything about Mr. Yon, period. And so we know very little about those years, but we do have some information. And this is the information that we have. We do know that Bradley's mother raised him. His father wasn't really around. And when he was 16 years old, his mother passed away. That particular event at that particular time in his life appears to have had a very profound effect on Bradley when you read the rest of the information in the PSI. And this is what I'm talking about because in Bradley's perhaps very understated way, he said that after that event, quote, everything went downhill. DCFS became involved in his life. He started banging his head against walls. And I wonder if for Bradley at that time in his life, that event shifted the earth for him. But the death of his mother was not a singular loss. It, it reverberated across his life because it was as a result of that, his siblings ended up splitting up. He tried to reach out to his siblings. He tried to maintain that bond, those connections. He felt responsible for doing that. And he was apparently able to maintain something of a close relationship with one sister, one sister. But he now feels, in his words, abandoned by that sister due to certain events. And it's curious that he chose that word, abandoned. His use of that particular word may actually reveal more about his continued sense of loss than he intended. Did these traumatic experiences fatalistically determine the course of events for Bradley's life? And this case in particular, of course not, he didn't. But the science has demonstrated that there is a clear connection between traumatic experiences and particularly traumatic experiences in childhood and later behavioral health and mental health. And that, Your Honor, I think is certainly relevant in this case. And I think that it is mitigating in this case. There are very severe mandatory minimums that as uh, by law, the court must impose in this case, given the jury verdict and the court's ruling on our post-trial motion today. But I am asking that the court sentence Bradley not in excess of what is required by law. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nelson.
Court has considered the pre-sentence investigation reports, the evidence presented at trial, and the statement by Mr. Yon, the arguments of counsel, as well as the statements and victim impact statements given today by family members. All of the statutory and non-statutory factors in aggravation and mitigation, whether specifically mentioned or not, the history and character of the defendant, and having due regard for the seriousness of the offense and with the objective of restoring the defendant to useful citizenship, I find the following. As to, actors in, or as to factors in aggravation, certainly the conduct caused or threatened serious harm. The defendant did receive compensation in taking the items from the person, vehicle, and home of his victim. The defendant has a, an extensive history of prior delinquency and criminal activity, including not less than 12 misdemeanors, but more importantly, sentences to the various departments of corrections in Illinois and Missouri, including three years, three years, three years, five years, four years, three years, three years, and seven years. None of which curtailed Mr. Yon from committing these offenses. The court finds that a sentence is necessary to deter others from committing the same crimes, specifically finds the victim to have been 65 or 60 years or older, being 76, 77 years of age. I also note that according to the PSI, Mr. Yon was on a pretrial release for a felony in St. Charles County, Missouri, 2111-CR-03413, an unlawful possession of firearm by a dangerous felon, a Class C felony in Missouri. Also, Marion County, Missouri, 21MR-CR-00188, or a charged second degree burglary, which would be a class four felony in Missouri. In reviewing the factors in mitigation, I am in agreement with the state's position. I find none that apply to Mr. Yon. And again, the court is to consider the character of the offender. Mr. Yon, in my practice of law and in all my years, you are the most reprehensible person I've had in court before me as public defender, as state's attorney, and now as judge. You take no responsibility for crimes that you clearly committed and were proven beyond a reasonable doubt. I believe you're narcissistic and unable to appreciate that because to admit that would be admitting a fault and in your mind, you are perfect. Well, sir, you're going to be perfect for 130 years in prison because I'm adopting the state's recommendation. On count one, home invasion for using a dangerous weapon during such, the maximum 30 years is imposed. I'm also finding that that crime resulted in great bodily harm to the victim, meaning you'll serve it at 85%, not 50%. That'll be followed by 18 months mandatory supervised release if you're ever released. Count three, aggravated kidnapping, class X felony. I'm imposing the maximum 30 years. Department of Corrections, that likewise will be at 85% severe bodily injury. That will be consecutive to the sentence in count one. Count four, aggravated vehicular hijacking. Class X felony, six to 30 years. I'm imposing a 30 year sentence maximum followed by 18 months mandatory supervised release, specifically finding that that should be served at 85%, again, because your actions resulted in great bodily harm to the victim. 
Christine Lohman even said she wasn't hijacked Sir, herself. I would not speak. <clears throat> in the video. So that will be consecutive to counts one and three. Count five, maximum on the class X, aggravated criminal sexual assault, range 16 to 40 years. I'm imposing the 40 year sentence. That will be followed by mandatory supervised release of three years to life. And that by statute will be mandatorily consecutive to the sentences imposed in counts one, three, and four. Those should total the 130 years being imposed. By statute, I must advise that at 85%, you'll be serving a total minimum of 110 years in the Illinois Department of Corrections. I should do it. Anything else regarding sentencing, Mr. Jones, prior to advising of appeal rights? No, Your Honor. Mr. Nelson? No. Mr. Yon, you do have the right to appeal. If you only want to appeal the judgment of conviction, not including the correctness of the sentence imposed or any aspect of the sentencing hearing, then within 30 days of today's date, you must file with the circuit clerk of Adams County a written notice of appeal or request that the circuit clerk prepare and file it on your behalf. However, if any part of what you want to appeal relates to the correctness of your sentence or any aspect of the sentencing hearing, then before you file a notice of appeal, you must file first within 30 days of today's date, a written motion to reconsider sentence and or challenging sentencing hearing. That likewise would be filed at the Adams County Circuit Clerk's Office. Your motion must be in writing, must be filed with the Circuit Clerk of this court within 30 days of today and must include all of the rounds or grounds or reasons for your motion as any issue or claim of error or mistake not included would be waived for purposes of your appeal. If your motion is granted, the sentence may be modified or some other action may be taken to correct whatever the problem may be. If your motion is denied, okay. If your motion is denied, then you would have 30 days from the date the motion was denied to file with the circuit clerk of the court a written notice of appeal or to request that the circuit clerk prepare and file it on your behalf to start the process of going to the appellate court. If you cannot afford the assistance of an attorney for your motion or your appeal, an attorney will be appointed to represent you free of charge. If you cannot afford copies of the transcripts in your case, for your motion or appeal, those likewise will be provided to you free of charge. Do you understand your right to appeal, Mr. Yon? Yes, sir. All right. It will be in recess. Mr. Your Honor, with, uh, I have some things to take up with regards to the uh, transcripts. I'm still waiting on pretrial transcript that you said would come a long time ago. Mr. Yon, you're represented by counsel, and so he'll need to make all motions and arguments to the court if he chooses to do so. Okay, uh, as far as appeal, I'll represent myself on appeal at this at this time. So I'm going to need the transcripts. I mean, unless they're being manipulated like the last ones were, and they need time to do that. Mr. Yon, again, you're being represented by counsel at this time, and so he'll have to make all motions and arguments for you. Mr. Jones, do we want to take up the 22 CF 713 and 720? Seriously? Judge, based on the court sentence today, um, I'll have an order prepared showing those cases are dismissed. 
I'm sorry, we're going to have to go back on the record also. Thank you for reminding me of that. Mr. Yon, because 22 CF 671, you were sentenced to seven years while you were awaiting trial in this matter, these sentences are also going to be consecutive to that sentence. So that'll be a total of 137 you'll be serving. Six seventy one, the one where y'all violated my rights. That's enough. I'm asking the question. Right. I don't need him back for any other previous corpus. All right. So when you got the orders drafted? Yes, the orders are drafted Sorry. and uh, we're providing those to Mr. Nelson. Make sure that is Seven twenty-three miscast. Mm -hmm. State's motion twenty-one CF seven thirteen, twenty-one CF seven twenty-three are being dismissed. That order also will be provided to you. Anything else, Mr. Jones? Nothing from the people on this case, Your Honor. Mr. Nelson? Nothing. Thank you. We adjourned in this case. Wow, he he ran his mouth on the yeah. way out, huh? I didn't catch oh, it. You, he you, did. Go ahead. You you know what he said? Uh, he I, I couldn't catch all of it, but basically he was saying he because there was a lot that was cut out there um, between the time the judge left and him leaving. He actually was like harassing Keck, and Jones was like, "You need to stop." Um, and then he kept saying stuff like, you'll see me back here, like looking straight at the family saying like, I'll be back here. I'm going to oh, see so you. D yeah, it was gross. It his, was really his letter gross. was the, the most disgusting thing today, but I, I, I didn't see yeah. that Yeah, like at the very yeah. beginning when they, when they brought him in. Yes. Although I didn't, the, the I, I, eight pages. Yeah, yeah, I didn't really want to bust on the, the guy, but he gets up there and they start asking him about the letter. He's like, yeah, I left it back there. I'm like, uh, you, you had one job. You had one job today. <laughs> that, that was to testify about this letter. But he did a nice job. He did he a nice nervous. job by... You could tell he was he, nervous. Uh, no, the officer was fine. He, 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 he got the drill. Yeah, He didn't yeah. say a word. He let the prosecutor read whatever he wanted and then agreed with yep. it. <laughs> yep. 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 That's exactly right. Yes. Which, yes. Which but was he was nervous. I could tell. Yeah. Yeah. No, the yeah. family, when you heard the yes, I saw some people in the uh, chat ask how the family reacted. That was the family. All that noise was the family um, reacting 
They were very relieved. One of the daughters and the person who had the hardest job in the courtroom uh, was Mr. Nelson because he was in a lose-lose position, right? Yeah. The public defender. Um, when he, he was talking about him losing his mom and having 13 brothers or sisters, like she was visibly upset in, in disdain towards what was being said. Um, but the family was relieved and the person who was like, bye, have fun in jail. That was the woman with the dress, um, with like a, yeah. the longer, the younger one. I, yeah, I, she was, I know from the tone, cause it just saw her victim impact. I know who it was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She was like, bye, have fun. Uh, and one of the female law enforcement officers, I think has some connection with her. I'm not totally sure. I'm sure uh, it's, because she, it's not a big town. No, absolutely not. Exactly. Exactly. And people are going to know people. Not. Yes. Yeah. And the law enforcement was just like so over him. You could see, like they were kind of yeah. snickering during the the leprechaun comments and the family when he got the Ooh, the judge. Yeah. When he told him he's like, you know, basically, basically you're the worst guy I've ever seen in mm -hmm. you know however many years on the bench plus being a prosecutor. I mean, you know, hell, I'm an old attorney. I've I've seen a lot of bad th bad stuff. That's a big mm -hmm. statement from an attorney. It is. Mark I thought Jones. so too. I thought so too. He said because you run into a lot of bad people. When he said you you you're the worst one, I'm I'm gonna tell you I can tell you that right now before I sentence you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that, right. that's a bad sign. That's a bad yeah. sign. Guess what's coming next? <laughs> <laughs> You're not free. Uh, I actually really like the judge. The prosecutors were fantastic. Uh, yeah. A lot of people were upset, but the, the defense attorney I thought was great. The, the whole process was great. I thought the defense attorney was great. He had nothing to say. He had an untenable argument. Right. The, the, what what I will say for him is he didn't prattle on very long. You yeah. got to say something for a few minutes. Right. You got a guy going away for the rest of his life. You can't yeah. just say, oh, yeah. 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 He had the yeah. hardest job in the entire room. I mean, and was, so he comes in and says, basically, this guy had a crap childhood, which none of us doubt. It doesn't it doesn't absolve him of this thing. But that's the only thing you could say that would lean towards without admitting something mm -hmm. that, that, that doesn't suggest guilt. That you can say it to the judge and sort of ask for some sympathy based upon that, and it's not mm -hmm. offensive to the family. It's not another. Oh, it was though. To the <laughs> they he's were saying, very offended. He's saying my my guy. But, implicit in that is yeah, he's a, he's a he's a bad right. guy. Yeah, you know. So yeah. even though you don't want to listen to it and it's not effective, that's not his fault. It, it, right. He could have oh, had a lot no. more if, if if the guy let him talk during trial and told him to shut up, and there there would have been a lot more things to say. You're right. Oh yeah, for sure. I I'm just glad he was, I'm just glad that he was there though. And, um, you know, it wasn't Jan who had to get to, you know, stay blah, 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 blah. Cause it, he would have gone on forever. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. You saved, you saved thank me you. tonight. I didn't, I, I literally am like, I don't want to do this just because it's so serious. It's interesting, but it's just like mm -hmm. such a bummer. And then, yeah. and so I sent you the thing and then you mm -hmm. hopped on here and, and, and helped, helped it along. Cause the, you know, that's really cool that you were there. Yeah, it was, it was nice to be there. It felt, it almost felt like I was in a sacred place in terms of the yeah. family, you know, not necessarily the court, but for right. the family to have this place to be able to, to speak peace, their minds because they have, they've been going on for like two years because of the delays, motions, delays, motions, delays. Well, and they did great. It's just, it was nice that they had that time and everyone was very respectful of them. Minus Jan. And no one was there for Jan. So as usual, it's your fault. It was very much so my fault. <laughs> Everyone no, said, I, I had hey, to do this you that did the whole the whole trial. And, and it's one thing during yeah. the trial because he's he's being a jerk and it, that it, that's offensive. But I, I just yeah. know the victim impact statements are always going to they're always going to be difficult. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, and being offensive on top of it, saying, oh, I didn't do anything like in the middle of impact statements. And then afterwards, when he had something to say to look straight at them, be like, there's more you don't know to all of this and blah, blah, blah. Like, and we all have a lot of people have crap childhoods. You don't get to go around like hurting people just because of it. I mean, yeah, it's bad. Well, Ultimately, we got to the end, though. The the right thing happened. I, I mean, I, I knew he was going to go away, for, you know, yeah, effectively for the rest of his life. Even even if the judge yeah. gave him half that, he's he's going right. away for the rest of his life. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And, although you could you could tell the judge was having none of it when he was warming up. Um. So the so the right thing happened to the extent possible under under Illinois law. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so too. I think so too. And his his track record. He, he doesn't need to be out hurting other people, and he will be. If, if he were to have any type of sentence that would have allowed him to, to be walking around the streets again, he, he definitely would have been hurting other people. So, Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know where they're going to put him in the Illinois Department of Corrections, but it, it, whatever it is, it's going to be a rough ride. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm curious to see where he's going. I wonder if he's going to Jacksonville, Danville, yeah. who knows? We'll find out. I don't out. think he'll get a good reception anywhere he goes. <laughs> no, no. And he wasn't as much of a redhead as he looked on YouTube, which I was thankful for. I said oh, there wait, at wait, the moment you're gonna, thinking, oh my gosh, I hope. You're going to slide some ginger defense into this stream? Is that, is that what's going on here? <laughs> Don't blame the gingers. <laughs> He's not one of us. We love the gingers. We love the gingers. Just you not hear that, one. Biggin? <laughs> All right. Well, that is amazing that uh, that you did that. And thank you for sharing your perspective on that. And go, because yeah. I'm sure. Oh, and thank you for coming on here. So you just streamed. You're yeah, probably talking well, about you. all this stuff that whole time. Yeah. You're at, yeah. You're at the sentencing. Then you hit stream it, and then and then I hit you and say, "Hey, you know what? You know what you should do? You should talk about the Yone case with me." <laughs> I really enjoy it, though. I really do enjoy it. And again, like for me, it was so much more just about the family and showing them that like there are people who care. And you know, you did lose a family member, and that's terrible. And you know, people tune in to watch his crap, but people also care about what you guys have to say because you've lost someone dear to you. So. Oh, well that, that is really wild. All right. So send me some, some uh, wacky madcap fun to, to, uh, to clear this. Okay. You know, in, the, in the next it's few days, <laughs> like you, like you usually do. <laughs> All hey, right. You never know what kind of decor is going to be sitting around. <laughs> <laughs> you never know about the decor. <laughs> oh my God. It was Jenny in the comments made, made the, the heinous joke yeah. in the comments. Yes. And I, I, I laughed despite myself. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be good, Mike. I mean, there really is no such thing, but I'm, I'm trying to pretend to be good, Mike. You know, yeah, right. Cause that and, exists. And that made me laugh because, you know, Jackass says heinous. Mm-hmm. And then I've, I felt bad about it for about five minutes. And then I see that, that they make the joke twice in court and yeah. the family's laughing about it. I'm like, yeah. okay. Yes. Yeah. I absolutely. Better now. Anything <laughs> that, that was a, you know, a notch at him and his direction, they were, they were, they were happy about. Yeah, but he was defiant to the end, so he's he's running his mouth on the way out after the oh, same yeah. thing. Yeah. Oh, I, I also like the way the judge told told him to punch him. Ah, sorry, you're represented now. Shut your hole. Yeah. Yes. Don't want to hear it. He still <laughs> talked out of turn. It was. And the attorney didn't want to hear it. He's like, dummy, no, no, no. Oh, that's something you didn't see the whole time. He was like whispering to his attorney and and the attorney like his body language was you know Jan was behind oh, yeah. him and he's sitting there like poking at him and whispering and stuff like that and the attorney is just like you don't shut the hell up yeah yeah 
Yeah, the he's stuff he's like, oh, like sure. he's like, oh, I need some, I need some, like you know, pretrial discovery materials, uh, dude. You, you, you are convicted post jury trial. You just got sentenced to the max. There's no basis for anything you're asking for. <laughs> and the judge, yeah, wasn't having it. He's like, uh huh, okay. So, all right, well, thank all you right. So much. Thank you for coming by. Thank you, everybody, Thank you. for coming out. I will see you all soon. Okay. Take care, you guys.